I prefer not to speak up of the days I work for Coca-Cola. However, I feel it's my duty to reveal the six secrets of this wicked corporation. They were willing to torment people, use them as puppets, torture them, and even take their lives, just to assure that their business stayed on top. Not too many years ago, I would say mm, around 2009, I was gaining acclaim for the diligence and impressive skill I displayed. The manager of our Coca-Cola sector promoted me to oversee the newest project they were working on. It was called Hypercola. Energy drinks were rising in popularity, and Coca-Cola had no product to compete in this field. Hypercola was supposed to alter just that. I had little knowledge on the ingredients within Hypercola, since I was mainly dealing with the marketing for the product. I knew the goal, however, was to create an energy drink that was highly addictive. After briefing with the team developing the beverage, we arrived at the conclusion that the only further testing we needed was fan-based opinion. We wanted to gather a wide variety of people to taste the drink. Several people from juvenile to elder, lean to plump, and even lanky to little arrived. We called them beta testers of our product. As they sipped the soda, all were rather pleased. Following the test, we placed all, well, by estimation 15, of them into a room. The room was entirely recreational. It possessed two basketball hoops, had slides streaming and twirling on the walls, and even offered several frisbees to toss. The area was quite vast, and even offered plenty of room for exercise. We all peered through the window to, in interest to see how active the hypercola caused them to be. We saw their elder people speed walk and stand taller, seeming more active. The juvenile younger people performed highly energetic activities, and strangely, one of the shorter beta testers stood in the corner, staring at a wall. It looked rather peculiar, but it appeared the drink had made everyone else seem much more enthusiastic. There was an older couple jogging, two younger brother and sisters tossing a frisbee, and even two middle-aged friends competing against each other in a game of one-on-one. -on -one. But now, there stood two people fixated on the corner, backs to us. The second person that accompanied the original was much older, looking to be in their 60s at least. Both of the figures were rather short, and they stood looking lifeless and hunched over. We wondered if they had been exhausted by the drink, or if they had decided to take a break. We weren't sure, but it gave me an unsettling feeling, and I could tell something was off. We decided to send an employee in to check on the two that stood in the corner. As he trekked through the open room, people looked to be getting more and more exhausted. In fact, on his voyage to the two standing in the corner, I noticed at least three more joined them. It looked... It looked as if this activity was slowly growing into the majority. Once our employee reached the group of beta testers, we all kept our eyes fixated on the area. He slowly shifted his arm into the air. He gazed directly to the back of the juvenile girl. He tapped her lightly... He tapped her shoulder lightly, resting only his index finger on her. He spoke, asking, Ma'am, are... Are you okay? The girl turned. Her appearance was revolting. She stood there, staring directly to the employee, gazing her blood-red eyes uncontestably at him. She licked her pale white skin, and she had an unaltered grin on her face. Her lips stretched to either side of her face. Her eyelids widened, and her pupils soon encompassed to the borders of her eyes. Pupils dilated, lips flaking, and skin of empty color, she spoke. Help. Her message was delivered with an uneasy tone as she trembled. This was all she could manage to say before collapsing to the floor. More of the people piled in and quickly, the entire group lies staring at the corner of this room. All of the employees quickly brought the patients to their quarantine room. Once in separated rooms, these patients, these patients seemed to look nearer and nearer to death. Their skin looked lifeless in coloration and many of them were were profusely vomiting in this thickly, vicious, neon-yellow-looking substance. They even began to say insane things and acted with rather unpredictable behavior. One of the patients began to violently scratch at the walls and express little signs of stopping. He was an intent of what he did. He, he looked fearful for his life, as if he was begging for every last breath in his, of his life to be released. His peeling lips opened wide, revealing his deteriorating teeth as he shrieked, Help! Help! He continued digging into the walls to the point where his nails snapped and flesh began to tear. We had workers run in and strap the patient up. However, 
By the time this happened, his fingers were already exposed to the bone on his hands. His skin peeled back from his finger, from his fingertips, and his hands were, were drenched in blood. His, his whole face, he was determined to do whatever it was he was drawing. Looking at many of the patients, they seemed to slowly be going insane. They all rummaged through their rooms, dosed in sweat. After a day or two, our medical staff had conducted tests on these patients. After a routine analysis, they confirmed an unknown substance from the drink was causing the patients to to rot their brains and decay at a considerable at a considerable fast rate. However, the only thing keeping them alive was the major amount of hyperactive chemicals within the beverage. Doctors confirmed that they would be able to solve the issue. However, the drink's effects would forever stay latent in their system. <laughs> Quickly, the scientists at our company conducted several tests on the beverage, attempting to discover what it was that caused that horrible reaction. Unfortunately, there was no explanation, no evidence anywhere. The company swiftly, re swiftly released the patients who faced the effects of the drink. However, none of them had any memory of the incident. The entire business stood in shock the next week, and all of us were told never to tell a word of it to anybody. The drink was obviously quickly thrown under the rug for its high danger. The company, of course, needed to protect itself, so because it was really big in popularity, it had little trouble in doing so. Coca-Cola quickly deleted all traces of Hypercola anywhere. Speculation of its arrival was disregarded, and articles of it on the internet, of course, were forced to be taken down. Also, as I've stated before, everyone within the industry refuses to speak about it. Everyone, that is, but me. I wouldn't be surprised at all if this article was taken down. After all, Coca-Cola has done a magnificent job of masking this outburst from the public.